so I'm hyperventilating a little bit. If I fall over, pick me up because I've got some things to say. Though we adore men individually, we agree that as a group they're rather stupid. That men are essential for procreation, but when it comes to pleasure, unnecessary. Dinosaurs eat men. Woman inherits the earth. Safety lights are for dudes. Safety lights are for dudes. <laughs> well, put some skates on. Be your own hero. Things of me are Kristen. Yeah. Lord, please give it up for the dazzling vocal stylings of Miss Kimberly. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Citizen Dame, the podcast where two women agree on just about everything, and when we don't. Karen admits that I'm correct. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> um, I am Lauren Humphreys Brooks, and I am always right. Um, with me is Karen Peterson, who is sometimes right. Uh, hi, Karen. Hi, Lauren. Um, I think you got that backwards, though. I'm the one that's always right. You're often correct. <laughs> Lies. Lies. Fake news. Fake news. Mm, we know about the people that call fake news. On yeah, things. I know. I'm just gonna. Well, I'm just gonna emulate our fearless leader and plug my ears. And just be like, no, it's not true. Whatever it is, it's not true. Uh, <laughs> so we have lots of interesting stuff to talk about today. Uh, some of it, I think, I think it's almost gonna be a retread of some stuff that we've already talked about, but it just keeps on coming up and coming back into the news. So we have to discuss it. Um, also, because I'm just constantly angry about it. Uh, but first. We want to again give a shout out to our patrons and to remind everybody that uh, we do have a Patreon and we would absolutely love for people to subscribe to it. You do get episodes early um, and then plus a lot of bonus content and buttons and fun stuff. So, you know, please consider subscribing to it. It does help us to like pay for hosting and our website and things like that. So I just wanted to give a shout out there. And also thank you again very much to our patrons who are, su who are subscribing to the Patreon. Um, we really do appreciate you guys and uh, you're awesome. So first of all, Karen, how are you? <laughs> I'm okay. <laughs> I don't know. The, <laughs> the tropical depression that they've been talking about, that's not me. I'm good. <laughs> Uh, You're not falling apart? <laughs> no, I'm not. I mean, sometimes I feel like I'm gonna, but, you know, I'm doing okay now. Um, yeah, it's been super busy. Oh, my gosh. I have screened, I think, seven movies in the last two weeks and went to an event or two as well. And that includes missing two separate screenings. So it's like it should wow. have been more than that. It's like, oh, man, award season is here. It is happening, and I am yeah. tired. <laughs> How are you? I am good. I am. Uh, I I missed. I missed the big event yesterday because I did not want to get up at like five o'clock in the morning to get to Uptown Manhattan uh, in order to go see. It. So I did not get to go see The Irishman yesterday. Although I am glad that everybody seems to have liked it. I am also glad that I got to sleep because I really needed it. Sleep is um, good. But I have seen some great films so far at New York Film Festival, which I will be talking about later. So it's it's been pretty good. Awesome. So to, let's just start at the top. Start with the big one, I guess, because we are still apparently talking about Joker, which is coming out this week. Um, this uh, this coming week. So when, when the episode is being released, it will be coming out in that week. Uh, and of course, Todd Phillips cannot shut his goddamn mouth. So as everybody has been talking about Joker, it's been getting more press screenings. It's been getting more attention. More and more issues are being raised about it. And one of those issues, um, was actually raised by the Aurora shooting victims and their families who were essentially said that they that a lot of them were very uncomfortable with the existence of the film and that they particularly really did not want to see it and now if we remember back to the aurora shooting um james holmes shot up a, a theater in aurora colorado uh and when he was arrested he he reportedly identified himself as i saying i am the joker um and so there's and it the shooting was during um, a screening of The Dark Knight Rises. So this has been kind of intertwined with this whole idea about media and 
media affecting or kind of giving voice to this disaffected, the disaffected white man sort of thing and its association with mass shootings. So there were some of the Aurora victims came out recently and essentially said that they were uncomfortable with um, the existence of the film just in general and also just saying that they really didn't want to see it. The theater uh, in Aurora, Colorado, where the shooting occurred, does not appear to be uh, scheduling any screenings of the Jokers, so it's it's not going to be shown. Um, this kind of started a cascade of responses on social media and just generally within within the press, talking about this you know this kind of association between Joker, between the character, and between film violence and real life violence. And it all kind of came to a head when James Holmes, uh, or not James Holmes, oh my God, wow. <laughs> that was a Freudian slip. I apologize. <laughs> Holy crap. Uh, Todd Phillips. <laughs> Oops. Um, Todd Phillips, uh, Todd Phillips came out, who's the director of the film, came out and um, basically began questioning why people were so upset and wondered why John Wick, which is a film, you know, John Wick recently came out, uh, it has not had uh, the same scrutiny over violence that the Joker has. And he said some not very intelligent things, <laughs> but one of his points that I think a lot of people have reiterated is, is that, this, that this is a movie, this is a fictional film, it is not real life, um, it, and, and as he said, it can have real world implications and opinions, but it's a fictional character in a fictional world that's been around for 80 years. Um, the one that bugs me more about a uh, toxic white male thing is when you go, oh, I just saw John Wick. He's a white male and he kills 300 people and everybody's laughing and hooting and hollering. Why does this movie get held to different standards? It honestly doesn't make sense to me. So I have opinions. Uh... Karen, I wanted to start with you to see what your opinions are. <laughs> oh, I have so uh, many. <laughs> in, I, I think, yeah, I have a feeling that we both do. So, like, this this issue that he's raising, that has been raised in different forms for years, really, about this relationship between real-life violence and, you know, television violence, movie violence, and maybe, like, what kind of responsibility art and film, et cetera, has, and what responsibility it doesn't have. You know, is there a difference between, dif you know, different kinds of violence and different uh, violence in different films? Yeah. Um, where to even start? First of all, uh, John Wick and Keanu Reeves, not white. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> by the way, uh, it's really interesting that he picked John Wick as his comparison and I'm sure that was specifically because John Wick 3 is this kind of ultra-violent movie. But, and I have to be careful because I would love to specifically point out some very clear examples of how these movies are so different. But I don't want to, I don't want to say spoilers right now. This movie doesn't come out for another week. But, um, the thing is that John Wick is v it, these characters are very very different and it's very clear what John's motivations are as he's like in the first movie it's well actually even in the third movie it's about his dog you know but it's what that dog represents to him and it's him getting pulled back into this life that is very definitely not part of the normal world around them it's this it's always very clear that it's this kind of you know, this underground mobster type world. And it, he's not going out and just the actions, the violence that happens, some of it does happen out in the public, but it's very clear that that's not part of normal everyday life for people. Joker, it's this guy who's very much just part of society. And, um, and so, like, the, the two characters, the entire motivations behind their stories are just very different. And, um, yeah, so the characters themselves and what motivates them, what drives them, the reasons that they exist, completely different. Um, and so I think that's why you're not going to see John Wick. Like, people aren't going to be emulating John Wick necessarily and going out and committing acts of mass violence. The thing about Joker is that I don't think that 
this is a movie that's going to inspire someone to, hey, I've never had these thoughts before. I'm going to go pick up a gun and shoot a bunch of people. I don't think that that's what's going to happen. And I don't think most people, at least people that have seen the movie, are saying that that's what's going to happen. But the problem is that it's celebrating. Well, celebrating is maybe not the right word. I do think it's inadvertently giving a point of view to the people that do those things. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, and the thing is, I say inadvertently because it's become very clear from reading these interviews with Todd Phillips that he does not understand the movie that he made. <laughs> it's weird. I've never seen someone with so little awareness of the message that they're putting out. And like, I think he honestly thinks he just made an entertaining film. And I know that there are people that will watch it and will see it that way. But if you know anything about James Holmes or Jared Lautner or any of these other guys, it's really interesting. It's like it checks the boxes of everything that's that, you know, a lot of the things that happened. So, yeah, I've been reading these interviews and with Todd Phillips and also the one with Joaquin Phoenix, where he actually got up and left in the middle of it because he didn't know how to answer the question, apparently. And it's very strange. I've never seen a situation where I got such a strong sense that the filmmaker does not know what he made, doesn't understand his movie, doesn't understand the script, doesn't understand the message of it, any of it. It's it's the weirdest, most bizarre situation. But then I started thinking about the movies that he has made, and I'm like, okay, this is a guy who really does make movies just because he thinks they're entertaining. And and there's not a, a level of depth and thought to most of what he does. And if that were the case and he was doing this as like a, you know, just a fun comedy homage to the Joker or something, maybe that would have been something I could get behind. But it's like he accidentally made, I know I made, I made this comparison before, but it's like he accidentally made a biopic about the Aurora shooter. And it's it's really weird. And I got into a conversation on Twitter the other day with someone, actually one of our award circuit writers, who was trying to defend Phillips, defend the movie. By the way, has not seen the movie. <laughs> um, but trying to defend it and saying, well, this is a mistake. And all I said was, you know what? You got to remember that this theater and the people that work there and the people in that community were all victimized. Yeah. Not just the people that were inside that room when it happened, but everybody there was was part of that. And I think we need to be respectful of it. And if the theater doesn't want to show the movie, they don't have to show the dang movie. You know, it's just a movie. We like to throw that around, right? So, uh, yeah, I, it's going to be very interesting. One of the things I'm really looking forward to in a weird way is this thing coming out so that we can finally start talking about some of the specifics about it. I think that people have blown this up bigger than it needed to be, but I also think that having seen it, there are reasons to be concerned more about what this is saying than about anything that will likely or may happen after the fact. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, I think I think it definitely makes sense. Um... I, I think, and you know, and, I, and I'm coming from, I'm sort of in the same position as a lot of these people who have been defending it, which is that I haven't seen the film. It's, I have only just, you know, listened to what has been going on around it. But one of the things that I kind of wanted to talk about, and um, and it's interesting in terms of this film, and it's interesting just in terms of the way we talk about cinema, is this issue of, you know, movies don't cause mass shootings, which is true. Guns cause mass shootings, crazy people cause mass shootings, violent people cause mass shootings. Um, but that there has been this attitude that has developed, and part of that is because of the the way that, you know, video games being blamed for Columbine. Um, and, you know, video games and violent music basically being blamed for Columbine and stuff like that. And it's kind of all spiraled out of that, this, this whole idea that, you know, somehow media is responsible for the behavior of these violent people, which isn't true. But the opposite is also in many ways not true. It's not that media has absolutely no responsibility. And one of the things that we like talking about is we like talking about art 
and the way that art interacts with society and with culture and that art does have an impact outside of just its basic existence. So one of the things that I've seen a lot of is just like, well, but it's just a movie about, about the Joker. This is a character that has been around for, you know, 50 years, 80 years, something like that. Um, it's like, yeah, he has, but he's also changed over time. He's come to represent different things over time. You know, you can, you know, watching an interview with Cesar Romero about his performance as the Joker in the Batman TV series is very, very different. I was so glad you shared that interview because that was delightful. <laughs> and yeah, exactly. And, and like, if you watch that series, you're just like, oh my God. I mean, he's, he's ridiculous. He's funny. He's like, uh-huh. he's a cartoon character, you know? Yeah. Uh, and, and that's a very, very different character from the one that Jack Nicholson played in the, um, in the, the original Tim Burton Batman film and is very different from the one that Heath Ledger played, etc. So the Joker has changed as a character over time and has become more or less cartoony and has represented various things. Um, so, but, but this whole idea that, that, that these films do not influence or have some effect on our culture and on the way that we approach culture and the way that we approach real life violence is very odd to me because uh, one of the examples that I used on Twitter is talking about the whole concept of the good guy with a gun, which has been around in American cinema for a very long time and is particularly founded in in Westerns and to a lesser extent in gangster films, Um, but particularly came to prominence in the late 70s and into the 80s when you began getting films like Dirty Harry and Rambo and even movies like Die Hard. Um, which are very much about this this lone white man, usually, uh, against everybody, against all of the violence and corruption and ugliness, very often represented by people of color um, in, in the world. And, to the, and so that in itself has then affected the way that we approach gun culture in the United States and the power of um, organizations like the NRA and this whole idea that, you know, I need to, if if we only had one good guy with a gun, we'd be able to stop all the bad guys. But of course, in reality, that's not how, that's not how it works. And even when you talk about these films, everybody seems to ignore the fact that people like John McClane or Dirty Harry or Rambo are all trained police officers and military personnel. Um, These are not just random citizens who pick up a gun and suddenly become heroes. True. But so I, I feel like that there's this tendency to just to just be like, well, right now to just be like, well, media has absolutely no effect on the way that people perceive um, the way that people perceive reality. And that's that's absolutely not true. You know, why do we talk about things like diversity in cinema? Why do we talk about issues of the gays and issues of um, the way that women are represented, the way that the way that men are represented? If that's not important, if it's just a movie, then none of the, then, you know, why, why are there critics? Why do we even talk about film? If it's, if it's just a movie, then there's absolutely no purpose behind it. And it's not art. It isn't important. So, you know, we should just completely ignore it. But of course, it it does have an effect on the way that we approach these things. And so the idea that, you know, no, the Joker as a character is not going to, quote, cause mass shootings. But it could definitely project some kind of attitude towards violence and some kind of attitude of the the disaffected white man who is cast out from society, who is ignored by society and who is failed by it, and who responds to it with violence. And I mean, we've seen that so many times in real life. I don't know how you can make the argument that this piece of art does not somehow represent that or does not somehow have an effect on it. So to your point, exactly. I think that one of my concerns in this is that there are a lot of, a lot of people that are going to feel seen by Joker and they're the kinds of people that you don't want to, (laughs) you don't want them feeling seen and understood because they're going to do bad shit. And I, again, I'm not saying that this movie is going to cause people to go out and commit shootings everywhere, but it's definitely going to fuel the fire of people that are on the edge that feel like society owes them something or society is somehow wronging them 
and that's I mean that's exactly what this movie's about I'm sorry to say it but it is yeah it's it's this whole concept that and I've heard this a couple of times now in fact someone just responded to me on Twitter saying like well we need to understand these people and it's like do we though I mean I think that we understand them I think that we you know we understand white male disaffection we understand privilege we understand you know the the whole concept of of the incel and these things that men that certain types of men are like i am owed something by society i'm i I am owed something by women i am because i am a straight white man i am owed these things and what we're getting is uh and and we don't really need to understand those people anymore we understand them we know why they behave the way they do uh they're not victims. They are not, they are not people that, you know, deserve our sympathy. They are not poor doomed little boys. They are adult men who are killing people and hurting people in really horrific ways. And so I think that, you know, it's the, this whole idea that we have to have some kind of sympathy that we have to get why people be, why particular kinds of men behave like this just really rubs me the wrong way. It's, it's like, we really, you know, we have all this demand for the abuser to be understood, but we really don't seem to give much of a shit about the victims. Exactly. That's exactly right. I just, it's going to be very interesting to see the way the conversation goes next week when this is out, because I think that, I think people have a lot of specific expectations for what's going to happen. And I think they're going to be very surprised. Um, some people will be like, oh, that's cool. But I think most people are going to be like, wait, what? what? Why Why would they do that? Why? <laughs> and um, yeah. Uh, and I'm sorry, but no, it's not clear that you're not supposed to be rooting for him. So, sorry. Well, it really, uh, everything that I've heard, even from some of the people that have liked the film, everything that I've heard is like, they have, like, the film is almost something beyond what anyone intended it to be. Um, yeah. Todd Phillips, et cetera, which is, is, is concerning because you want films to actually be expressions of, even if they get misinterpreted, you still want the film to be, to be an expression of what the artist making it wanted it to be. And if you've got a director, if you've got a lead actor, if you've got a script writer who does not really know what they've done, that's very frightening to me. Mm-hmm. But yeah, absolutely. Anyways, we will have to wait and see. We will all see Joker. I am sure I am not going to see it opening weekend because I'm <laughs> just not. I am refuse to participate in that. Uh, yeah. We'll yep. see. But let's... Wise choice. <laughs> let's, let's move on to slightly happier things. I mean, you know, we're, we're going to talk about disaffected white men. Uh, Andrew Scott is going to play Tom Ripley. Uh, for those of you who do not know who Andrew Scott is, Andrew Scott was the hot priest on Fleabag. He was also Moriarty in um, uh, the series Sherlock. And he's been around on stage and on screen for quite a long time. I feel like he's just really come to prominence in the United States over the past year or so when suddenly when Fleabag became such a, a major thing. Um... But so Andrew Scott is going to be appearing as uh, Tom Ripley, the Patricia Highsmith character, um, in an ongoing series for Showtime. And based upon the release that um, The Hollywood Reporter was quoting, it sounds like that they are doing more than just the original Talented Mr. Ripley novel. They actually might be going into some of the later novels, um, which is kind of the growth of the character of Ripley and... Uh, various things happen to him he gets involved in art forgery he gets involved with contract killing like there's all sorts of exciting shit that goes on in ripley's life but most people know him from uh the original tom ripley novel the talented mr ripley and then from the 1999 um film the talented mr ripley starring jude law and matt damon I have a particular relationship with this character because I absolutely adore Patricia Highsmith and I particularly love her Ripley novels. He is a fascinating character and I am a little uncertain about what they're going to do and whether or not um, Scott specifically is, is going to work for this character. Do you have any thoughts about this, Karen? 
it, it's hard for me to have some thoughts because I never read the book, uh, any of the books. I've seen the one with Matt Damon and Jude Law, and I like that movie, but also that's another one where it's very clear that you're not supposed to be rooting for him to win, but you kind of do a little bit, sort of. It's weird. I have mixed feelings about it, but uh, but I like the movie. Um, I don't really have a perf- particular affinity for Andrew Scott, but I also am like, I could see, depending on what direction they go, and it does sound like it will be interesting if they do tie in the other novels. I mean, this could be something that spans multiple seasons, which could be cool. I think it's a fascinating character. And actually hearing you talk so much about the books has made me be like, I need to read these finally. So <laughs> the books really are, I mean, they're great. And one of the interesting things about Ripley that I, th- I think you get a little bit of in the 99 film, but that you get much more of in like, Purple Noon, which is the one, it's it's an adaptation of The Talented Mr. Ripley with Alan Delon. Oh. Uh, and and it's, it's a, that's a very different film, but I think that Delon really occupies the character of Ripley because Ripley sort of starts out as being this kind of sad, bit of a loser um, who gradually discovers essentially that he's a very good con man. And he begins to enter, and it follows very similar to, to what the 99 film does of him entering um, Dickie's life and becoming more and more enmeshed in that world and being very attracted to this world of power and prestige and money uh, that these people represent. One of the things that I really disliked about the 99 film is the way that it, it makes what is an undercurrent in Highsmith's book very explicit which is this sort of love relationship, romantic relationship almost between Ripley and Dickie, which is kind of there. There's a little bit of, of an attraction going on, but it's more, it's really is more that Ripley wants to be him. Yeah. It's not so much that he wants to sleep with him or that he's in love with him. It, he wants to be him. He wants to occupy his body essentially. Um, and that that is what develops over the course of the book. One of the interesting things that happens in later novels is that Ripley gets married. Uh, mm. He he has this very odd but interesting relationship with this young woman who's his wife, and she is a fascinating character in herself. But the the whole thing is this whole use that the ninety nine film makes of you know the the main force behind Ripley's behavior is that he's a repressed homosexual, really does a disservice. Uh, to the character and I think also does a disservice um, I mean it, it kind of makes explicit this whole idea of the murderous gay man uh, who because he's rejected responds with violence and that's very that's a very disturbing way to approach the character and I think this also does a disservice to the character because Ripley is a lot more complicated than that um, so yeah so I'm interested in this I would be interested to see where they go with it I would love to see if they actually do the plots of the other novels because it cha- his character changes and um, the stories surrounding him change. And so by the end of it, uh, you know, there comes a point where he, he's almost like, he begins to regret even every everything that he's gone through because he realizes, you know, how difficult it is to continue to maintain some of the lies that he's established about himself. Uh but so I'd be interested to see it. I'm a little bit iffy about Andrew Scott. I think some of it is going to come down to how they choose to approach the character. And also, at least within the first story, how they choose to um, cast Dickie. Yeah, that's going to that's gonna really make it, make it or break it, probably. Yeah, so that will be coming out. When is that coming out? Um, I don't know. They just cast it, so they, I don't think that they've established like a release date yet for it. But... Sometime in 2020. Should be interesting. Um, let's see. Let's move on to a little bit more casting news. This is fun casting news. I'm so glad that we're moving away from the Joker. <laughs> um, so some fun casting news. Is Jurassic- this fun though? <laughs> well, which which one? I mean, Jurassic World three. Uh huh. Has cast. It looks like Jeff Goldblum, Laura Dern, and Sam Neill are all going to reunite. For Jurassic World three, uh, they're going to come back as the their original characters. This is the first time all three of them have been together in a Jurassic Park franchise film since the original nineteen ninety three film. 
This is probably the only thing that could get me to see another Jurassic World movie, to be totally <laughs> honest. And I have a feeling that Colin Trevorrow, etc., are aware of this fact. That there are a lot of people that will go solely to see these three people playing those characters again so many years later. So, I don't know. You do not sound very excited about this, Karen. <laughs> I mean, it's Colin Trevorrow and it's Jurassic World. No, I'm not excited, <laughs> but... And and when I first heard it, I was like, there's nothing, nothing that could compel them to get back together and face off against dinosaurs. But then I remembered, oh, wait, there's dinosaurs just running around in America now. So I guess they're kind of stuck. If it's if it starts off with, like, a dinosaur knocking on Alan's door, I'm going to be like, I'm <laughs> leaving. Bye. <laughs> uh, unless it talks to him, like in, <laughs> like in Jurassic Park 3. Hey, Alan. <laughs> Sorry. I love that. Um, well, it's stupid and I love it. But anyway, I, I, yeah, I mean, this will, this makes me marginally more excited to at least see how they're going to work them into the story, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> yeah, I, to be totally honest, I did not see Jurassic World 2, whatever that was. Was Jurassic World 2? Yeah, must be. Fallen Kingdom. Yeah. Yes, Fallen Kingdom. Um, so I have no idea what's happening other than Goldblum the... was in it, man. I know he was in it, but I also was informed that he was in it for like five minutes. So I don't even know if it was that long, honestly. Yeah. So there's no reason <laughs> for me. So, so if they bring back these characters for extended periods of time, I am totally down for it. If it's just going to be like one scene of like, Hey, it's the original cast. Like, no, I don't give a shit. Um, but so, yeah. It's so... going to end up that like. It's going to end up that, like, Sam Neill is secretly uh, Bryce Dallas Howard's dad or something. Oh, God. <laughs> or I... Jeff Goldblum, because he likes to get married and have kids a lot in, <laughs> in these movies. That's so. true. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Well, yeah. and, 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 uh, several people have been like, well, does this mean they're going to, you know, actually bring back the entire original cast? Are we going to get the kids again? Um, or uh, Julianne Moore's character from The Lost World? And... Like, I mean, I don't really give a shit, but, um, yeah, so that's going to happen. Isn't that exciting? I'm sure that we're all excited about that. Uh, I just like seeing Jeff Goldblum on screen. So, uh, that's me. (laughs) Yes. It's always a good day when you see Jeff Goldblum on screen. That is true. And so final piece of casting that I think Karen put on here, because I definitely was not paying attention to this. Um, (laughs) Jonah Hill is being and this is a quotation, eyed for a secret role opposite Robert Pattinson in The (laughs) Batman. Uh, This has, of course, provoked a multitude of um, fan art representing Jonah Hill of of (laughs) playing everyone from Robin to the Penguin (laughs) to the Riddler to, like, I don't even know. And I I was like, okay, he's playing a secret character. And I do kind of wonder, again, if this is going to be like he's going to show up for, you know, a hot second. And we'll be (laughs) like, oh, it's Jonah Hill as a secret character in The Batman. Um, Yeah. Well, the reason that they said it's a secret character is because they haven't decided who he's going to play. That is is the sticking point. They apparently have been in negotiations for, like, a month. (laughs) trying to decide on a character so it's not really secret it's just unknown (laughs) so yeah i mean i think he might actually be kind of interesting for the riddler i think that would be interesting he could be and that's it's like most people think it's either going to be the penguin or the riddler but there are some other characters i'm like let's bring in some other some other stuff there's this one character called clayface that i don't think has ever been he might have appeared in the TV show with, with uh, Adam West, but um, I don't remember. But, I mean, he could be really fun, and I think that Jonah Hill actually would work really well for that. Or, And I, I don't, someone else had mentioned that one, too. Um, but they're just, it's like, let's let's do something different. We Everybody knows the Joker. Everybody knows the Penguin. Everybody knows the Riddler because of Jim Carrey. But... You know, there's there's like 50 villains that they could pull from that are actually all men. Like, they all, they're also are female. That's not even getting into the women that they could, you know, go up against. But Jonah, Jonah Hill as Catwoman. Oh my gosh, um... that would be... I would, I would maybe pay for that. 
<laughs> I would totally pay for that. Um, what was the other one that I thought? Oh, Egghead, I think, is the Vincent Egghead Price, would be good. The Vincent mm-hmm. Price character. Mr. Freeze. Mm-hmm. You know, that's I was the one who had said Robin, but... Robin. For some yeah. reason, people thought that I was being serious. <laughs> I actually think that could be a lot of fun. It would depend on how they way. did it. Yeah. If if they're making this a fun Batman movie, they could definitely play with that and make it hilarious. But I don't. I think they're going the gritty serious still. Yeah. And if that's the case, then it would definitely not work. Yeah. After having watched Cesar Romero talk with such glee and joy about playing the Joker, I really want them to bring back just the ridiculous campy lots of fun batman i mean people were talking people were talking about batman forever uh last week and i was just reminded of how much i enjoyed that film as a child Mm -hmm. and just and yes it's stupid it's silly it's bright and neon colored it's like ridiculous but it's so much fun (laughs) exactly i really liked that one a lot i think it's it's like you said it's so fun it's. I like the fact that it's bright and colorful and audacious and ridiculous in some places, and they managed to fit in a <laughs> a joke from the TV series where Robin's like, "Holy rusted metal," yeah, <laughs> like stuff like that. It's just so funny. No, see, it's it's rusted and it's full of holes. <laughs> it's holy. <laughs> oh, I love that. That's one of my favorite jokes in all the Batman movies. Well, it was the only Batman film I could watch as a kid because the the earlier Tim Burton ones frightened me too much. Like the oh yeah, um, Batman. Oh, Return- Batman too is yeah. Batman Returns is scary. Batman Returns is scary, and I really like both of those films. I like the first one, and I like the second one. But um, like at around the time I forget how old I was, but around the time when Batman Forever came out, I was the right age for it, and it was just fun. Like you know the Tommy Lee Jones and. Uh, and Jim Carrey just chewing the scenery for most of the film, and it's Val Kilmer is at his peak hotness. I mean, I don't think there's anything to argue with about it. So, so yes, so the new Batman film is probably going to start filming late 2019, early 2020, assuming, of course, that we figure out who the hell Jonah Hill is going to play, because it sounds like they don't even know. Uh, but it will be, I'm certain, interesting and exciting. Uh, Karen, you wanted to talk about California's AB5 bill and yes. how it affects freelancers. So this is kind of switching gears again um, to, to talk about something more within the industry and particularly in the way that it's going to affect uh, uh, freelancers at this time, at least based upon the wording of the bill now. Yeah, so this question had come up a couple weeks ago, and I talked about how I didn't really think that, and this is based on reading language from the actual text of the bill at that time, I knew people were concerned, but I didn't really think that it was going to be something that would ultimately affect freelance writers. It was more focused on um, rideshare, um, those kinds of, of delivery services, things like that, Postmates, Uber, that kind of stuff, um, things that things where the industry is based on technology, like apps and stuff like that. Well, they've made some updates and changes and things, and it finally was signed by the governor a couple weeks ago, or I guess just last week. And they did a lot of negotiations with people, and of course they won't name who was involved in this process, but basically what has happened is that now the law as it is written as it is passed as it goes into effect january 1st anybody that is a freelance writer for any media outlet that is based in california and they live in california um, actually they don't even have to be based in california the writer lives in california so it could be a new york company um like for instance my company award circuit is is in New Jersey, but because I live in California, my boss and I have to talk about this and how this is going to impact us because I'm paid as a freelancer there. And so basically the, the deal is that the, the intention of the law is to stop companies from taking advantage of people, turning full-time jobs into freelance to save money, things like that. But of course we know that they're the, the industry 
that we're in, it's not it's not necessarily dying, it's evolving and there's just not as much money and and opportunities for freelance work anymore. And so this is supposed to be this is an attempt to fix that and protect workers, but it's actually going about it the wrong way because a lot of people choose freelance work for a lot of different reasons. So what they've done is they've said, okay, well you can freelance, but if it's if what you're doing is in the normal course of a business that, that you're working for, then they have to hire you in a position. So they can't they can't freelance someone to in theory, they can't freelance like hire freelancers to do uh, film coverage if it's a film entertainment website because theoretically that's their business and that's what they do. So it gets into this weird, well, but normally our business isn't inter is in interviews, so we're gonna outsource that to freelancers, you know that kind of thing. So it gets into all these weird questions. So, but then also what they've done is now they've set this very arbitrary limit that was negotiated between labor unions and this group of freelancers that they won't name. Uh, that now you can, you have a maximum of 35 bylines in a year. That is what counts. If an outlet is going to have you write more than 35 in a year, then they have to hire you as an employee and pay you as an employee. But of course, that's not going to happen. They're just going to get a lot more freelancers to do a lot less work. That's yeah. just how that works. So this is going to be completely backwards. So a lot of people are panicking, understandably so. Part of the problem, though, is that this law is basically unenforceable. There are so many companies, and it would also, in order for the state to, to crack down on this, the employees that are affected and the freelancers that are affected would have to actually make complaints and file lawsuits and things. And people aren't going to want to do that to their jobs. So we do have some companies that are, that are reacting. They're, they're panicked that they're going to be, you know, having to, to do this. And so they've gone ahead and, and started reducing the workload on some of their freelance staff. And, but they're also not hiring more writers now what they're doing is just making editors do the job that they've been having freelancers do. So it's people that already work there. Now they're just giving them more work. And so that's, this is very much one of those cases of a law that's going to have so many unintended consequences. And what I think will happen is that it will technically go into effect in January. Nobody's going to follow it. I mean, there's been a similar law on the books in Massachusetts, apparently, for 10 years, and they haven't cracked down on a single person or single company because they can't. It's just not, they just can't do it. And the lawsuits that result, they last for years. So I think what'll happen is it'll go into effect technically January 1st, and either eventually it'll get taken off the books or it'll just be one of those laws that just sits there and nobody ever does anything with it. Like the fact that you can't wear high heels on 25th Street in downtown Ogden, Utah. <laughs> and it's still a law, but nobody cares anymore. So yeah, that's what I think. There you go. I was sort of halfway paying attention to it because obviously I have a lot of friends who live in California and and who freelance and of course you know and i know you've talked about it kristen has talked about it a, a number of different people have discussed you know the possible impacts of course you can never know what are what is actually going to come to fruition and what isn't um, right one of the things that i saw that makes sense and i wonder if you have uh, feelings about this or an opinion on it is that it looks like there are already companies that are beginning to post jobs freelance jobs and are saying that excluding people who live in California and Massachusetts mm -hmm. because of these laws. So I, I wonder, is that, do you think that that's going to have this kind of ripple effect where you've got Californian freelancers or, or Massachusetts freelancers who are just basically not able to apply for things because the company doesn't want to have to deal with the possible fallout? Yeah. And that's where I say like, this is full of a lot of unintended consequences. I think that's one of them is that companies are just going to say, well, fine, I'm just not going to hire people that are in California because then I don't have to worry about it. Yeah. And and not just, and, and the thing is too, what has ha happened with a couple of cases is there are companies that are not even working in the United States now. They're hiring, they're hiring writers from other countries to cover stuff like entertainment news because you don't have to, you know, proximity doesn't matter when you're writing about Jonah Hill maybe being in the Batman, yeah. you know? 
And so that's definitely the things that are happening. And so I think if that becomes widespread, that's where there will be pressure to just repeal the law because you're going to have a lot of workers now that, like I said, a lot of them are freelance by choice for a lot of reasons, you know, and people like that lifestyle and, and the freedom that it gives them. And so I think that if this becomes a widespread problem where people are just not hiring folks in California, then there will be pressure on the legislature to repeal this bullshit mm -hmm. and get it off the books. If, if people just kind of generally go ah, business as usual and don't worry about it, that's when it'll be one of those that just kind of languishes and nobody does anything mm -hmm. about it. So I think, I think what ends up happening and with that law is going to depend a lot on the companies and how they choose to react to it. Well, it's interesting. I mean, I think that we're obviously going to have to keep on following it and everything. Like you said, you're going to have to deal with it at some level uh, mm -hmm. one way or another. But it's I don't, it's interesting. I mean, it's such a gig economy. And I mean, I'm a freelancer. I'm an editorial freelancer. Um, I occasionally write uh, film reviews, et cetera, for pay. But but for the most part, you know, I'm I'm kind of occupied in a different position. But this kind of thing does make me nervous. You know, I'm, I'm a resident of New York, but there's so many people that are full-time freelancers. That's what I am. Uh, and either as writers, as editors, as designers, as all kinds of things. And to suddenly have this, you know, as you're saying, an arbitrary limit put on how much work you can do, it essentially means that, you know, you're it's going to change the way that, that we operate and it's going to make it much more difficult for some people to remain as freelancers. And, and I do it, I mean, I specifically do it because I like it and I don't want to have a single boss. Um, and I enjoy that, you know, I, there, but there are some people that do it because almost because they have to, because there's not much of another option for them for full-time employment in the same mm -hmm. way. Um, so I don't know. It will be interesting. Yeah. Well, people like, yeah, people like Kristen, you know, it, it, freelance work really is is helpful for people that are disabled, that have, you know, moms that have kids and dads that have kids at home and need to work around those schedules. It, it really is beneficial to people who, for whatever circumstances are going on in their lives, a nine to five job just doesn't work for them. And so it gives them the freedom to be able to find another way to afford to live. And trying to take that away, I know, like I said, I know that it's it's out of a, a good intention. I think their their hope is like, hey, we can give people, you know, this will get people full-time jobs and they'll have benefits and things like that. But that's not the reality. And that's also not what a lot of people want. Well, we shall wait and see what actually happens. So I don't yes. know. It's it's an interesting issue. So uh, moving on, I just want to do one more final Female Filmmakers Month. Uh, by the time this episode comes out, Female Filmmakers Month will be over, but it still is right at this moment. So I just wanted to say something particularly about the fact that Kino Lorber's Pioneers First Women Filmmakers Collection is available on Netflix. And I was reminded of this yesterday, and I just want to reiterate it again because it's because we sometimes miss the fact that Netflix actually has some really interesting stuff. Um, the first female, first women filmmakers collection is a, a fantastic resource. It has some fascinating films. The vast majority of them, I believe are, are on the Netflix. There might be a few, the a few stragglers or a few of the longer ones that aren't available. They just go and, and like watch a selection, watch, you know, some of the, the short films, some of the fragments it's a fascinating um, resource and it's, it's really interesting to see the different kinds of films that women have made uh, in the very, very early part of Hollywood and of um, uh, primarily American filmmaking. So please, please go check it out. If you have a Netflix subscription, there's no reason not to. There's so much good stuff on there. There's Mabel Normand and um, Alice Guy Blaché and Lois Weber and um, Zora Neale Hurston, like there are all kinds of interesting films that really just deserve to be seen and deserve to be recognized um, on their own. Karen, do you have any final recommendations for Female Filmmakers Month? Oh man, I suck and I was not prepared. I didn't do my homework. 
Um, I do want to just really quickly shout out the fact, because I forgot to put it on the agenda, but I wanted to really quickly mention the fact that Disney highly hired a female director Yay! for Star Wars. Um, oh, shoot. What's her name? Danielle Chow um, is going to be directing the Obi-Wan Kenobi series for Disney+. Plus. So I'm super excited about that. I think that's awesome and amazing. and I'm really happy. Um, it's that's been a long time coming, and I hope that that's opening a floodgate and not just a one and done type of situation. You know. Any so anything further about female filmmakers month, or we can we can move on. Yeah, let's move on because right. I mean I think that the the Kino Lorber stuff I think is really significant. I'm excited to dive into that. So props to the ladies. We love our female filmmakers. Every month really should be female filmmakers month. Uh, it's true. <laughs> And, okay, so moving on, moving on, speaking of female filmmakers, um, I think that we're going to move on with reviews, and I really wanted to talk about one of the films that I got to see at New York Film Festival this past week at a press screening, Portrait of a Lady on Fire, which is directed by um, Celine Shiyama, I probably pronounced her name wrong, uh, and is about a um, young painter named Marion in at the end of the 18th century who's commissioned to paint a portrait of a young woman uh, that is going to be sent to this young woman's um, prospective fiance in order to kind of entice him to to want to meet her and to want to marry her. So with, over the course of her painting this portrait, uh, the two of them begin to fall in love. And it is about their relationship, about particularly their relationship that kind of builds itself via art and via the way that the look, the way that these women have to look at each other for long periods of time. It is one of the most just, just artistically gorgeous films I have seen this year. Uh, there are some shots and some of the compositions of shots that are incredibly artistic, but at the same time, it isn't, it's not like a living painting. Um, it, it's much more physical and, and sensual than that. Uh, and the way that it, the way that the camera uses that to kind of build their relationship, but to build just the way that they look at each other. Cause there's, there's a lot, there's a good bit of dialogue, but there isn't, it's one of those films where everything is said when nothing is said. And as their relationship begins to develop and their feelings for each other begin to develop, the way that the camera looks at the two of them, the way that they, sh that it shows them looking at each other is just incredibly intense without, um, without being objectifying, without, you know, being particularly male. Uh, I've, I've heard a number of male critics, and I complained about this, but even just as I came out of the film, because I was already seeing it, I've heard a number of male critics talk about the camera gaze as being observational. No, it is not observational. <laughs> this, it, the, my, my first response was, no, they're lesbians. Um, <laughs> this, is, this is an incredibly lesbian movie. Uh, it's not even a queer movie. It's a lesbian movie. And it's the way that these two women just fall for each other in such a deep and abiding way. And the way that the camera chooses to look at the two of them and the way that they look at each other uh, is just like, it's, it's difficult to put into words because it really is so incredibly visual. Um, it is, it's a fantastic film. Like, I cannot recommend it enough. I do not want to, like, start sliding into hyperbole and being like, it's the, you know, it's the greatest masterpiece in the history of Western cinema or anything like that. But it, it is really a marvelous film. I highly recommend that if, uh, to be able to see it on a big screen, to actually be able to experience sort of the scope, um, the, both the scope and the intimacy of the way the film, uh, depicts it, its central relationship. I also just want to say that there is not a single male character of note in this entire movie. And in fact, there are only two men, uh, one of whom has two lines. The other one has, I think, three lines. And that's it. And they are not named. They are not important. They are almost there just because they had to be there in order to drive the plot forward. And that was really, really nice. It was nice to see a movie that is so focused on femininity and on female relationships. Uh, so I, I highly recommend it, uh, and it's, it's just a beautiful film. So 
I want to move on. I'm really looking forward to that one. I haven't seen it yet, and oh, I can't wait. <laughs> it's so good. So I'm going to come back to New York Film Festival in a minute, but Karen, you wanted to talk about Judy. I did. It's out in theaters this weekend, and it's the story about Judy Garland, and it's it's really focused on the last, well, the first half of the last year of her life, and but it does flash back to when she was younger, and um, I think it was even before they started filming The Wizard of Oz, it was like the casting process and stuff, and going back and forth, and um, the movie, I mean, people are really singing Renee Zellweger's praises for this and she does do a good job she's really good with the musical numbers uh, she, did, she did her own singing and uh, which was a challenge for her because she sounds much different from Judy Garland yeah. but she manages to really uh, what she did with her voice and the way that she trained to sing she doesn't sound identical to Judy or anything like that but it's definitely it's done in such a way that you really feel that sense of homage to her. And so she did a really great job with that. I think the movie itself has... I, I, I found myself wishing that it was actually like a week of this time instead of spreading it out over six months. Like if it had been her last week in, in London during these shows that she did, I think it could have been really good because it would have really tightened the timeline watching this because it's just going through and checking the boxes of and then this happened and then this happened and then that and as I was watching it I just kept thinking this feels like I went through a whole process in my mind I was like this is like the Cliff's Notes version and then I went no they don't use those anymore this is like Sparks Notes nope nope wait they don't use that anymore that's a dated reference to you this is the Wikipedia entry <laughs> <laughs> on the last year of Judy Garland's life. And that's really that's really how it feels. It just is like it just brushes over a lot of these big events that happen, like her final marriage, uh the custody battle with her ex husband, um things like that. And so it just it never really got into any of, of that with any real depth. Which was unfortunate. There's one scene that happens that was lovely and there I don't I don't have any re, any way of knowing if this is something that was based on reality I should look into it but so I don't know if it was true but it involves two people that keep coming to her show week after week and uh, she just has this really lovely moment with them and it's beautiful and so much of what's really good in her performance happens in these quiet moments a lot of a lot of her best work is actually nonverbal there's a scene where she's inside a closet or where she's you know sick in the bathroom or whatever and those are the moments where you really get the weight of this difficult life that she's had and the terrible things that she's been through, uh, some of them by her own bad choices and some of them just because people have been bad to her. And so I think that's where it really shines. But overall, as a movie, I didn't think it was, it, it was a little bit disappointing that it wasn't better because I think if they had really just tightened it up and just focused on just this one, this one week where a lot happened and instead of just kind of, cramming in stuff before that you know if they had just just taken the time to just really let that that moment just play out I think it could have been a really great film that being said it's not bad and I think a lot of people are going to like it the music is like I said really good and there are some beautiful moments and um you know if Renee Zellweger gets an Oscar nomination for this I'll be very happy for her because she's great she she's an interesting actress. She tends to get underrated a lot, I think, and it would be yeah, yeah, it would be nice to see her actually get some recognition for it. At the same time, honestly, this this movie has never particularly interested me. But glad to hear that it is not bad. Yeah, <laughs> not bad. That's <laughs> I think that's the best way to describe it. It's not bad. <laughs> it isn't bad. Okay. Uh, so I wanted to talk about another film that I saw at New York Film Festival this week um, that I believe is actually premiering this weekend uh, in, in the United States. It has been, it uh, competed for the Palm d'Or at Cannes, um, and it was also, I believe, awarded for Best Actor and Best Soundtrack, uh, and it is 
also the Spanish entry for Best International Feature Film at the Academy Awards this year. The film is Pain and Glory, Almodovar's latest work, and it is a fascinating film because it's probably his most autobiographical. Um, it is about a, uh, a film director played by Antonio Banderas, um, who basically has been in so much physical and in some ways emotional pain for the past four years that he hasn't been able to make another film, and he hasn't wanted to make another film. And over the course of the film, he um, meets a number of different people from his past. He also has flashbacks to his time as a child living with his mother and father in a uh, in a cave, quite literally in a cave. Uh, and it's it's a really interesting film. It doesn't have it is one of those films that has a major central arc. There's not a point that the director needs to get to, but it's very much focused on particularly on Banderas and on his performance and on kind of this director figuring out how to be an artist again and you know what steps he needs to take in order to do. You know, what, what does he need to do? Does he need to make film? Is he okay not making film? Uh, and it's about his relationships with all these different people in his life. It's a very, very interesting film. It's very different from a lot of Almodovar's films. It's not what we expect from him. Uh, it's much more subdued. It's much quieter in a lot of ways. It's much more introspective. Uh, there are some melodramatic moments, but that's not really what the film is about. And in fact, a lot of the emotion is incredibly real and, uh, and, and also very subtle. It isn't, it isn't about these big explosions or these big events, but about these smaller things that kind of go into the life of an artist and an artist who desperately wants to make art, but also is terrified to try to make art again because he's in so much pain. Um, it's uh, Banderas is, is fantastic. I mean, I don't think that anyone would ever fault him, uh, but this is probably one of his best performances in years. And he gets into kind of the reality of this director. And it's interesting to see him playing what is essentially a slightly different, but also the same version of Alma Dovar, who's directing him at the same time. So the relationship between Banderas is the actor and the character and the director who's filming him all coalesce and it works really well. And I think that there's a, there's an absence of ego in both his performance and in the direction that I think allows for this character to develop organically on screen. It doesn't feel like this is just a self insert character for Almo Dovar that he's speaking through Banderas. Banderas is speaking for himself and speaking for his character. Uh, it's a fascinating film. I, I, you know, I want to caution people not to go in thinking that this is going to be the skin I live in or um, some of Alma Dovar's earlier films, but it it is a, one of his best uh, in years, and it is a really interesting film, particularly for those who love him and love his work, and I I do to to see kind of how he approaches filmmaking and the kinds of stories that he wants to tell and the kind of pain that goes into producing art. Um, so it's, I really recommend it. I recommend seeing it. Uh, and at, at the very least, because it's Antonio Banderas being directed by Almodovar and that's always a good time. Awesome. Yeah. That's another one that I'm really interested in. And I don't know, uh, again, actors that are doing really good work. I think Antonio Banderas is probably going to finally get his first Oscar nomination and he could win. Yeah. Yeah, no. Be I, exciting. I think I I hope so. I hope so. It's it would be one of the wonder I I got to go see um the press conference following the screening of the film and one of the things that he said cuz they were talking about the fact that he's playing, you know, a version of of someone who has been his friend for 30 years. Uh and and they and one of the things that he said was um, that if he's made eight films with Almodovar and he said that if he had only made those eight films, that would be a career. And that was hmm. just one of the most wonderful things that I had heard an actor say about a director, that he is so proud of the work that he did with Almodovar, that if he had made nothing else, he would feel that he had fulfilled a career. Um, and that was just that was just wonderful. Like he's very, he is a very charming man, I by the that. way. 
I bet he is. Daenerys is a <laughs> very like charming it. man. Like, yeah. he really is. Um, <laughs> so, so Karen, I, 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 we're going to talk about this film a little bit closer to the time that it comes out, but I'm certain that some of our listeners are very excited to hear from you a little bit, just a little bit, about Jojo Rabbit. Oh my gosh. I saw Jojo Rabbit this week, and it's been my most anticipated movie not called Star Wars since <laughs> I first heard it existed, and... It was everything I wanted it to be. I was so happy. I was giggling through the entire opening, and I was sobbing at the end. I mean, this movie runs the gamut of emotions, and it's so well done. It's not just a straight-up comedy. It really has a lot of depth to it. And I've been talking to a couple of people in the days since uh, since I saw it. They've also watched it, and... I'm a little bit concerned because some I think some people are missing the point a little bit, oh, no. and that's unfortunate because I think that there's a lot of of real real depth and a real understanding of not just the time period Nazi Germany in nineteen forty three or whatever forty five but um uh but also a real understanding of the parallels between that time and the time that we're in now. And because it's easy to go, Ugh, another World War II Nazi movie, but there's a very specific reason that Taika Waititi chose this project for right now. Mm -hmm. And I think that he did such a beautiful job with it. And I love it. I'm excited about it. I think he could, speaking of Oscar, I'm in Oscar season, so this is all I'm thinking about <laughs> now, but I think, I think he could get an Oscar nomination for Best Director, which the idea of that just makes my brain just so happy. Um, yeah, I, I just, oh, I'm excited. I can't wait. I cannot wait for you to see this, and I cannot wait to have, like, really good in-depth conversations with you about it. I, I am I am actually really excited about this film. Not, maybe not as much as you are, but I, I am really looking forward to it coming out and to getting to see it, because there hasn't been a film of his that I've disliked, so yeah, there's that. Yeah, he's good. And, he's good. And I always like seeing him on screen as well, so that will be nice. Oh my gosh. And don't don't be dissuaded by those Metacritic scores. Like someone was asking me, well, how do you reconcile that? And I'm like, okay, well, let's actually break down one of these scores because it's got a 53 right now, I think, on Metacritic. It might have bounced up a little bit since it's starting to screen other places. But um, but yeah, so it's got like 100 and a 90 and a couple of 80s. And then you go down and someone gave it a zero. And I'm like, okay, regard even if you don't like the story, this is not a zero movie. Like, mm -hmm. I wouldn't even give the Joker a zero, and I hated the Joker. Um, you know, so it's like, let's. So I thought, okay, well, I'm gonna read this and see why he thought this movie is worth no points, <laughs> you know, at all. And he actually, this person said in the review that he doesn't think that Taiko ITT has a has a knowledge, has an understanding I, uh, I'm misquoting this a little bit but basically the Taika Waititi doesn't know how to tell a good story about oppression <laughs> yeah Taika Waititi <laughs> for those of you who are not aware is um, half Maori and half Jewish so um, he doesn't I think get he knows oppression. what he's doing <laughs> right so I was just like, okay, so this is what we're working with here. So when you see these scores, when you see these reviews and you're like, oh, man, that person really hated it, dig into it a little bit. Find out why. Find out what didn't work for them. Because a lot of times you're going to find this stupid crap where they don't even know what they're talking about. And that score, it's like, I wish I could petition Metacritic to just throw it out because it's ridiculous. And they gave it a zero specifically to tank the rate, the overall average mm -hmm. for that movie and it's stupid and it shouldn't be allowed yeah that, i mean that's always the concern with anything like metacritic or rotten tomatoes or any of those yeah but it's it's first of all i mean with rotten tomatoes it's really hard to find nuance you get a little bit more of that with metacritic because of their the way that they do the algorithm and the scale but yeah when you're getting when you're getting responses that are just like oh 190 80 and then you suddenly get ones that are zero there's a split going on there that is very questionable. 
Uh huh. Um, exactly. But yeah, I mean, I would I would urge everybody to never solely rely on the the scores being given on critic algorithm sites because it there's always there's always an open question about why and about how those ratings have been arrived at and uh -huh. uh, and stuff like that. So, but good. Yeah. I I am I'm exactly. looking forward to this film. I'm I'm really pleased that you liked it because it would have been very sad if you hadn't. <laughs> I would have been so sad if I hadn't, <laughs> no. but oh, I loved it. I loved it so much. It's as much as I adore Parasite, Jojo Rabbit's now my number one movie of the year. Amazing. Oh, and I am yeah. getting to see Parasite next week, so I'm looking forward to <gasps> Yay! that. Yay! Yeah. Oh, we should have a really good conversation about that one. I'm excited. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, that's the press screening is early-ish in the morning, but I'm willing I'm willing to go for this one because it is not a three-and-a-half-hour film. <laughs> uh, yeah. so, so what do you have on tap for next week, Karen? What do I have on tap? Uh, this week I'm seeing Lucy in the Sky with uh, Natalie Portman, mm -hmm. and I'm also seeing The Lighthouse with Willem Dafoe and Robert Pattinson. Ooh. Yeah, I'm very curious about that one. And then I'm doing some prep because the week after, I'm going to the Hamptons Film Festival. And that is official. I have a plane ticket. So this is happening. I'm, yeah. I'm so excited. Yeah. Coming to the, coming so, yeah. To the East Coast. The better coast in many ways. Uh, <laughs> we'll see about that. Our, our this will be the longest I've ever spent in New York, actually. Wow. I mean, the Hamptons isn't I know. quite New York. But yeah, well, it's it's the state of New York. <laughs> sure, sure. Is it the state of New York? I didn't realize. I I always for whatever reason I always associate the Hamptons with Massachusetts, but I guess it is technically New York State. Um, Isn't it Long Island? I'm yes, so confused. Probably. <laughs> Something okay. like that. I don't know. You know, it, when you get down to this end of the state, it gets really confusing as to where things actually are because technically. Both like Brooklyn and Queens are both on the same part of of the island, and we're also on Long Island. But you really don't associate Brooklyn and Queens as being in the same like space time continuum, basically. <laughs> okay. Uh, so hmm. yeah, geography works differently here, <laughs> and that's the basic conclusion. <laughs> so yeah, so next so next week I get to see Parasite. Uh, I'm not certain what else I'm going to get to see. Maybe Motherless Brooklyn, which I oh, I saw that. I am iffy about. Uh, that's another early morning screening. And that's a long movie. Yeah, it is a long movie. So we'll see about that. But I'm definitely looking forward to Parasite. That's been one of that's been at the top of my list for quite a long time. So I'm I'm looking forward to getting to go see that. So I think that that will close us out for today. Thank you so much for joining us, everybody. As per usual, you can get in touch with us so many different ways. We are always on Twitter at Citizen Dame Pod. We are on Instagram at Citizen Dame Pod. We are on Facebook. That's facebook.com slash Citizen Dame. You can get in touch with us via email. That's at Citizen Dame Pod at gmail.com. Our website is, of course, citizendamepod.com. Uh, we've got some reviews up. We're going to have a whole bunch of New York Film Festival reviews coming up in the next couple of weeks as more of the films premiere and I get things done. So do go and check that out. Uh, we've also got a Patreon, of course. That's patreon.com slash citizendame. We have a Zazzle store, and I'm hoping to put up some more new stuff before long. That's at zazzle.com slash citizendame. And if you want to give us just a little bit of your money, but you don't want to make a commitment to Patreon, um, we do have a Ko-Fi account. That's ko-fi.com slash citizendame. And Karen, where can people get in touch with you? You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Karen M. Peterson. And I am at LH Business. So that is going to close us out. Thank you so much for listening, everybody. We will talk to you later. Bye. Everybody has their troubles. And I've had mine. I just want what everybody wants. I seem to have a harder time getting it. 